81 we came to spring training knowing we were a great team. Les exploits représentaient l'organisation du baseball majeur. On avait l'impression qu'il était en train de se bâtir une grande équipe à Montréal. We had what we felt was a pretty competitive ball club. I can remember talking to uh, Mike Schmidt. People think it's all fun and games to go to Montreal because he said it's a great city. Everybody loved to come to Montreal. But I go in there and I'm thinking, I got to face <laughs> Sanderson, Rogers, Blackson. He said, I'm going to face three tough right handers. Growing up in Missouri, it was uh, always a dream to play the game. There were no expectations that you would ever make it. And I went for my first tryout. And I tell this as kind of a joke, but it really actually happened. As a nine-year-old, they put me at shortstop. And after the third ground ball went through my legs, I became a pitcher. What was it like then to go to an organization that was based in Canada? It was a little bit of a culture shock. The next year, out of spring training, I went to the AAA team for the Expos. I went to Quebec City, and the ball players that went up there were embraced. There wasn't, there was no negativity, but the language was a barrier. I mean, but we learned, we learned, and we enjoyed it. So it's kind of a broken road to get to the major leagues, even in that year. But once I got there, I guess I was just too stupid to know how hard it is to get to the major leagues because everything just worked out really well. Dans l'histoire des Expos, c'est le meilleur lanceur qu'on a eu. In 1981, I have to go back to 79 when I came to the ballpark in Daytona Beach. I was a long-haired hippie released from the Red Sox for Stan Pappy. I came to the ballpark. I had a beard. The police wanted to arrest me. They weren't going to let me in. And Warren Cromarty said, no, no, that's Bill Lee. We traded for him. So they finally let me in the ballpark. And I had a tremendous spring training. In the 80s, the Expos represented the organization of baseball major. And the Expos were so close on several occasions to win a championship. I really have to tip my hat to John McHale in that time after losing 107 games in 1976. For the 77 season, they went out and got two free agents. That was Tony Perez and Dave Cash. All of a sudden, now we had that established second baseman and established first baseman. So the right side of the infield were veterans. It, and in the, in the lineup, it took so much pressure off of uh, uh, Dawson and, and, and Cromartie was just coming in and, you know, Parrish and Carter for sure. It allowed them to develop. in 77, Dick Williams came in, uh, and it, he demanded that we play well. My relationship with Dick at that point in time hadn't soured. I mean, he penciled my name in 40 times that year. So the evolution of my responsibilities were not only to pitch winning type games, but to eat up a lot of innings. So we were maturing as a, as a team, and yes, everything elevated in 79. It was very frustrating to be elim mathematically eliminated on the last day of the season, three years in a row. 
And then 81, we came to spring training knowing we were a great team. En 81, les, les, euh, les, les attentes étaient particulièrement élevées pour, pour l'équipe. Malgré les, les, les fins de saison un petit peu en queue de poisson, on, on, on avait l'impression qu'il était en train de se bâtir une grande équipe à Montréal. Tu avais des, des joueurs qui étaient dans, tout dans la force de l'âge, des gars comme Dawson, des gars comme Crew Marty, comme Tim Raines qui arrivait, tu Steve Rogers, tu avais Billy, tu avais Bill Galexa. C'était tous des gars en bas de 30 ans. Pour moi, you know, c'était mon rookie year. Je ne comprenais really pas vraiment. You know, I was a player that was trying to make my name for myself at the major league level. We felt that we were always close and probably another marquee player away. On avait une équipe probablement meilleure que n'importe quelle équipe de la Ligue nationale, mais on se faisait toujours battre par un match ou deux à la fin de saison. Mais là, les joueurs étaient vraiment décidés de gagner. My name is Michael Farber. In 1981, I was a sports columnist at the Montreal Gazette. The Expos are playing not only good baseball, but exciting baseball. And one way you entertain on the ball field is with speed. And former broadcaster Dave Van Horn used to talk about the track team. And the Expos had some very fast players. C'était épouvantable. On disait souvent, moi, c'était à 20 zéros nationaux, c'était un zéro Montréal. C'est pas compliqué, là. Ça flyait, là. T'avais hey, Rain, Scott, puis euh, Dawson en partant, là. Écoute, pas de coup sûr, c'était un zéro. Un but sur balle, un but volé, un autre but volé, ballon sacrifice. C'était régulier, tu voyais ça, là. Dawson ramassait pour un produit à Pelleté, mon vieux, il frappait, même pas, il frappait pas de coup sûr. Woody Fryman used to talk about a five-year window that all good teams had before age, before injury, before free agency, started fraying the makeup of the team. And so the Expos had been very close in 79, very close in 1980. Au début de la saison, <laughs> Finalement, on n'a pas gagné. <rire> Puis quand ça a recommencé, ben, le commissaire il dit ben, « on va faire deux saisons ». En 1981, j'étais directeur euh, du marketing pour euh, les expos. Au retour de la grève, j'avais trouvé euh, très ingénieux euh, les gens de, de Major League Baseball d'avoir apporté une solution Très créative. Ils ont eu au moins une idée géniale, c'est de séparer la saison en deux et stimuler l'intérêt en de deuxième moitié de saison avec une nouvelle course au championnat, une mini course au championnat, mais au moins, il y avait de l'intérêt pour toutes les équipes. We get through that 50 days and, and then we come back and we've got, I don't remember if it was a week or 10 days to work out to get, to get ready for the season. But we were the only team that didn't have a stadium to go to. We didn't have a stadium to go to because Olympic Stadium was full of dirt. They had a tractor pull or a, a motocross or something that was already booked in there. The only reason I bring this up is I believe, I firmly believe, that this one happenstance helped us win that second half. Great. I love it. Go ahead. We went down to West Palm Beach. Everybody went down there, no wives went. We all went down there just to get in shape. And it's the first time in 50 days, almost two months, that you've been together. The camaraderie that was built in that 10 days, it was really magnified by that 10-day stint in West Palm Beach. We came out of the strike feeling pretty good about ourselves. We were healthy, we were playing good, and then Dick Williams got canned. Ben, moi, je suis dans ma chambre d'hôtel, puis je dors, puis... <coughs> en tout cas, <rire> le téléphone sonne, je pense qu'il est 8 heures le matin. Ça, c'est la première fois que je vois ça, là. Conférence de presse des Expos, on nous convie dans la, la chambre de John McKay, dans la suite de John McKay. Il dit, ben oui, on donc, qu'est-ce qui se passe? Ça attend 8 heures le matin. La décision du congédiement de Dick Williams, ben, ça a été pris par, euh, par John McKay. C'est sûr que, publiquement, tu regardes ça, tu te dis, ben, c'est un peu surprenant, on a une fiche 
positive au moment du congédiement de Dick Williams. Mais je pense qu'une des choses qui agaçait McHale souverainement, c'est les rumeurs à l'effet que Dick Williams quitterait les expos à la fin de la saison pour se joindre aux Yankees de New York comme GM. He was the best manager I ever played for. He was the best manager after the seventh inning because he always had four left-handed relievers and four right-handed relievers or the other way around. This is left and this is right. And uh, he could bring them in at any time. He had Rudy May, he had Schatzner, he had me, he had Grimsley. Dick Williams. Dick was a, uh, uh, Dick was a little bit like Billy Martin. Uh-oh, Billy's just been tossed out of the game. He liked to incite anger, and he, he, he liked turmoil. I think pitches, I probably had a tougher time. He, he could be a lot tougher on pitches than position players. Dick Williams could easily have been the best manager I was ever around at managing the game between the white lines. In other words, nothing took him by surprise. Uh, from a personal standpoint, he and I were fire and water. One of the reporters comes in and says, uh, uh, well, we were just talking with uh, Dick outside, and he said that he wished he had had one of these good pitchers that he could pitch tonight, like Palmer or, or Bill Lee, but he had to go with you. He never won the big one. He, if he needed a big game, uh, he couldn't give you that total effort. Did not like one another, <laughs> and uh, God rest his soul, I mean, he deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, as far as personality goes, no. <laughs> We did not get along. La surprise, c'est quand il nous annonce que Jim Fanning est le nouveau gérant des Expos. Là, on se regarde tous et on dit Jim Fanning. C'est un papa bourbon, là, tu sais. Il connaissait tous, il les avait élevés, ces jeunes-là. Il avait fait signer des contrats. Il avait l'émotion et il savait le jeu. Nous savions que il n'avait pas beaucoup d'expérience à manager. But it's a little different than being there and anticipating things that, you know, might happen an inning down the way and being prepared for them. And all that stuff that it takes tons, it takes years of on the field managing to have a real feel for. So we, we understood there was also something being given up there. C'était comme un fan. C'est ça, Jim Fanning. Un géant doublé d'un fan. Il est dans l'abri des joueurs pendant un match à Philadelphie. Il y a un ballon qui est frappé vers Mike Schmidt, qui est le meilleur troisième but du baseball. Et Fanning est à genoux, mon vieux, sur les marches, puis il crie « Drop it! Drop it! » Échappe là! Tu cries ça à Mike Schmidt! It was kind of scratch your head and what's going on. Uh, no one really knew why they went that particular route, but... Hey, we were there to play baseball. And I, I think after the first couple games, couple three games, and we didn't play well. Didn't play well the first right out of the shoot when he came in. We lost our first three games. We had a team meeting in Philadelphia. Cromarty's there complaining. Everybody's complaining. And I stand up in the meeting and I say, Steve, you didn't like Dick Williams. But when he was out there managing, you played well. I think that managers, and there's a few of them that have had, that that didn't have good relationships with their with their pitching staff, with their pitchers as people and, and the pitching staff as a whole. And you had to have a strong pitching coach to act as a buffer in between the two. Okay? And you wanted to prove Dick Williams wrong, and you played better when Dick was managing. And did not like one another. <laughs> We didn't like him but we respected him. And I said, you cannot let Fanning manage this ball club out of the pennant race. You have to play for yourselves and play as a team. And uh, whatever mistakes the manager would make, we, you know, try to play through it and uh, not use, well, uh, the guy sh who should be here isn't here and let that be our downfall. We still had uh, a season where we felt we could win and we had to just go out and play winning baseball. We need to take charge of our play on the field and stop worrying about something with Jim Fanning. Jim Fanning's gonna put the right people out there. We gotta play. 
Fanning, la, toute la lourdeur qu'il y avait dans le vestiaire avec Dick Williams s'évapore soudainement. Puis ils sont mis à, à jouer encore du meilleur baseball qu'ils jouaient euh, sous la tutelle de Dick Williams. I think we embraced, we embraced the improbable. It wasn't like people ran up and down the, you know, in the locker rooms waving banners saying, okay, guys, rah, rah, rah. We got a chance to do something. We got a chance to win this second half. We got to do, we have to win the second half to play in the postseason. We have to do it. It's, it's a new set of rules this year, but we got to do it. And we had a tremendous streak. You know, I was back in the bullpen and I didn't care as long as I could just be uh, on that team. I just love those guys. The Expos are all on the field. Saturday, October 3rd, Shea Stadium. A warm, sunny afternoon, delightful fall afternoon. And I remember Wallace Johnson pinch hitting, seventh inning. And he pulled the ball right center between Lee Mazzilli, the center fielder, and former Expo Ellis Valentine was the right fielder. Drove in a couple of runs, and that was the winning hit. And Wallace Johnson, it was an unusual choice. I don't know why Jim Fanning sent Wallace Johnson, who was a nobody at the time. But Jim, there, he said, in my dreams, I saw him hit the ball with a gun. And that was the winning hit. And that was the winning hit. And that was the winning hit. Et effectivement, il y en a frappé. <laughs> C'est un trip. Donne la victoire aux Expos. It was amazing. It was my last win. I got the win in relief. Really special. Really special. Comme on dit, là, comme on dit chez nous, c'était vraiment capotant. Il y avait quand même beaucoup d'amateurs de baseball de Montréal qui étaient là. Montréal. Pas juste de Montréal. Là. Du Canada qui était là parce que euh, les Expos étaient euh, l'équipe canadienne par excellence dans le temps. Je vois encore Cromartie se promener avec le drapeau du Canada là, qui, qui se promène partout, puis tout le monde jubile dans le vestiaire. Puis... Tout le monde est joyeux, évidemment. Il se boit de la bière, puis euh, le champagne. C'était vraiment euh, une, une atmosphère. Là. Moi, j'écoute, on n'était pas habitué de voir ça. C'est la première fois qu'il gagnait quelque chose. Puis euh, c'était... Euh, c'était vraiment spécial. C'était vraiment... C'était un moment, là, moi, que j'oublierai jamais. C'était complètement fou. C'était complètement fou. Philadelphia Phillies had had the best record prior to the baseball strike. So the Expos were just really playing for the second half championship. And Wallace Johnson's hit on the next to last day of the season essentially put the Expos into the playoffs for the first and only time. So you don't get a ring for winning the second half of a split season, but you know now you have a chance to play for that ring. And so it was, uh, it, everybody understood the magnitude of it. It, it was exhilarating. We're going to enjoy today, we're going to enjoy tomorrow, and then we're getting ready to play the Phillies. Donc la fébrilité monte, puis il faut que ça revienne au niveau, euh, au niveau approprié, de façon à ce que tu puisses euh, être prêt pour ta série, euh, la série qui allait suivre, qui était contre les Phillies. We were in New York, so we didn't know what was going on in Montreal. We don't know how people felt about it and really didn't find out until returning. Lors euh, du retour des Expos après la victoire contre les Mets, il y avait eu à l'aéroport un rassemblement euh, énorme.
majorité des gens qui avaient jamais regardé le baseball de leur vie, là, tout le monde regardait le baseball. Là. Tout le monde me parlait de baseball. Tout le monde m'appelait pour des billets. C'est là, c'est malade. C'est là que j'ai réalisé, là, vraiment, là, c'était fou, mais pas à peu près. Là. We were the glue that held the people together. It was French and English loving one another. We were on St. Denis Street one day. We were on, uh, you know, on uh, Crescent Street the next. We were all over the place. I was at Nuit Magique. I was down there in the Soho, I called it, Old Montreal. Everybody loved us. We were the talk of the town. Electric. It was electric. I mean, you know, I, for me personally, I think uh, it was the reason why You know, part of the reason why, you know, I played the game the way I played it. For a short period, the Expos were more popular than the Canadiens. Montreal was not a one-brand town like it is now. Moi, je dirais même que les Expos étaient un petit peu en avance à ce moment-là. Ça n'a pas duré longtemps, mais tant que ça a duré, moi, je pense qu'à un moment donné, les Expos étaient plus populaires que le Canadien. Valdery Valdera. La première fois que j'ai joué ça, c'est au retour de Ross Testov. Quand Ross Testov est revenu, je crois que c'était en 79. Il y avait près de 55 000 personnes dans le stade ici. C'était bondé à craquer. C'est la première fois qu'il y avait tant de monde. Je me suis mis à jouer euh, Valdery Valdera. Cette fois-là, ils se sont mis à chanter. Ah ben là, là c'est la première fois qu'accompagnait un cœur de chant de 55 000 personnes. Ça veut dire qu'on vient de gagner. C'est la victoire, c'est la victoire. Quand le monde se mettait à chanter ça, là. I think people was waiting for something big to happen. Youpi! <laughs> I know it wasn't youpi, but then we had the dancer in the aisles, and we had, and uh, yeah, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was definitely not St. Louis baseball. <laughs> it, it definitely, it definitely was. I. I I, I, uh, you know, Valdery, Valderaw. Moi, je l'entendais jour et nuit. It's a time for a rally. It's a time to come back. It's the people in the audience getting, you know, we would get all excited. I came to Montreal. I came from Boston, which was not a singing culture. We did not Valdery, Valdera. We did not party all the way into the night. Uh, I had never seen a town until I understand the life expectancy of a Quebecois is a lot less than everybody else in Canada. And I found out why. <laughs> Valdery, Valdera. <laughs> La série contre les Phillies, c'est ça qui a donné le ton à notre saison encore davantage parce que Steve Rogers a battu Steve Carlton deux fois. Deux fois, là, il est au temps de la renommée, Steve Carlton. Steve Carlton was perennial Cy Young Award winner because he was that good. Quand il est arrivé à Philadelphie en 72, il a gagné 25 matchs puis l'équipe n'avait gagné 52. C'est juste pour vous donner une idée quel genre de lanceur, de lanceur que c'était. T'as tout un lanceur, c'est le à peu près le meilleur gaucher du baseball. Well, we had our ace against one of the best left-handers uh, in the game of future Hall of Famer. He had a tremendous run. Got a base hit up the middle to win that ball game. Pitched tremendously. Quand il marchait sur les eaux, ou à peu près, c'était... J'ai jamais vu lancer Steve Rogers comme ça. C'est comme si... Euh... Je sais pas, là, il... C'était quelqu'un de différent. Et il, il avait la réputation, lui, avant cette série-là, de perdre des matchs importants. De jouer un gros match, mais de le perdre de un. Tout le monde disait, ah, Steve Rogers, il est bon, mais... Euh, cette série-là, il a été pas mal bon. Il a été... Écoute, ça a été le meilleur moment de sa carrière. Battre Steve Carlton deux fois euh, en l'espace d'une semaine, là, c'était quelque chose. C'est le top of the food chain. And, you know, you're, you, it's, it's fun to compete at that level. If you take a snapshot of the baseball season late in 1981, that it was Steve Rogers who was the best pitcher in the game. Lui qui uh, Dick Williams disait toujours, il gagnera jamais les gros matchs. It may or may not be well known, but I was traded in the offseason. 
I was traded in the offseason. You may edit out that story. My understanding was, as a matter of fact, I've had it confirmed by the by both general managers. After the 1980 season, I there was a little falling out between the front office and me, and, and say, so, you know, it was two-way street. I then found out I had been traded for Al Oliver during the offseason. When Al Oliver was informed, he said, well, no. Otherwise, I'd have been in Texas in 1981. Alors après avoir gagné le deuxième match à Los Angeles, ça devenait un 2 de 3. Et trois matchs à Montréal. Freezing. <laughs> uh, you know, it's that time of the year, too, where the weather gets pretty frigid. Uh, but, you know, this is the playoffs. And, they, you know, they had to play in the same weather. They're actually from L.A., which... You know, they're not really used to that type of weather at all. It's cold everywhere. It was enclosed. It was kind of a, not a damp cold. It was kind of a, like being in a refrigerator cold. But it wasn't like being out on the tundra with the wind blowing on you cold. It, uh, you could get used to it. I could get a heat going. I enjoy pitching in the cold. Hitters don't like it. They don't like to get jammed. They don't like to hit the ball on the end of the bat. It makes your fingernails split and crack. And that's why hitters use gloves. On vit à Montréal, c'est 1 à 1. Il y a 54 000 personnes dans le stade. C'est fébrile. Parmi mes soirées mémorables, mes matchs mémorables dans l'histoire des Expos, c'est dans le top 3. Il y a deux gars qui buts, puis c'est Jerry White qui, est au, qui, qui se présente au bâton. Le petit Jerry White qui pèse euh, 145 livres. Là, là, il arrive au bâton. Il y a 50 000 personnes, ou à peu près. Euh, c'est plein, c'est électrique dans le stade. C'est vraiment là, t'en as des frissons, le monde euh, mouche debout. Je m'en souviens parce que, parce que des fois, on ne regarde pas toutes les présences au bâton, à un moment donné, on est fou. Là. Mais lui, je, je m'attarde à le regarder. Toc! Je frappe la balle, je la vois encore partir. Circuit de trois points. 50 000 spectateurs se lèvent d'un bond. En même temps, comme s'il avait pratiqué. J'ai jamais vu ça. C'est comme s'il y a une bombe qui avait explosé dans le stade. Puis là, on avait notre meilleur lanceur avec un monticule. Quand Jerry Royce, qui était pas piqué des rails non plus, là. When we played the first two games in, in L.A., and I flew back that day, I wasn't at the second game. It, it gave me a full two days of rest. So I had some success because they were a dominant right-handed hitting team. Much like the Phillies were, and you know, I tried to keep the left-handers from hurting me, and uh, so I, you know, again, it was, uh, it was just, it's, it was just baseball. That's what it was at, at the highest level, but it was baseball. There it is. Steve Rogers again. C'est de la foule au stade olympique, c'était extraordinaire. À ce moment-là, le match est fini, les Expos mènent 2-1. Ils ne sont plus qu'à une seule victoire d'une première participation à la Série mondiale. One game away. Quatrième match. Il s'est rien passé de particulier. Moi, je m'attendais, comme bien des gens, que la Série atteigne la limite. Ça devenait une saison qui allait reposer sur un match. Le dimanche... Là, on était prêts. Le dimanche, tout à coup, il s'est mis à pleuvoir, à pleuvoir, à faire froid. À un moment donné, il y a eu une décision qui a été prise de, de, de remettre le match au lendemain. It was really to nobody's benefit, except Ray Burris and perhaps Fernando Valenzuela, to postpone that game. Fernando was Fernando. He raised his head up. He had, he was like Louis Tion from the left side. He would turn your back on you. He had a great screwball, a great changeup. You know, he, he got those right-handed hitters out on their front foot and you couldn't do anything with it. And he threw just hard enough 
up and in, and you'd swear you were going to crush him, and you'd hit a fly ball. Écoute, là, il était sorti de nulle part, lui, là, un Mexicain. Écoute, c'était vraiment, là, c'était l'attraction numéro un du baseball majeur. Tout le monde parlait de Fernando Valenzuela. I only hit off of Fernando maybe two plate appearances, two, two times. I will tell you, I have no idea how anybody ever hit him because the screwball would get to home plate at 75, 8, 75, 76 miles an hour, and then it would just disappear. It just never got to home. I don't know how it did it. <laughs> it would just go out of sight. It's gray and cold and drizzly in Montreal. Temperature around 45 degrees. Mais le lundi, on l'avait d'un quart en première manche. C'est comme un boxeur, ça, si vous ne l'achetez pas, là, il peut rebondir. Tommy Lasorda already has a reliever up, Bobby Castillo. Andre Dawson is at the plate. Andre didn't have a great late September or October, but he was still Andre Dawson. Who was the leader on that team? This guy. Well, <laughs> Carter thought he was our leader. He wasn't our leader. Andre Dawson was the silent leader of that ball club. He was the guy that you looked up to. Every time you went into the clubhouse early, he was on the training table. He had a syringe in his knee. They were either putting in cortisone or taking out blood, one or the other. He always had a needle in his knee. He was just the most injured ball player and the gutsiest ball player I ever played with. Première manche. Dawson au bâton. Il euh, y, y a deux coureurs ses buts. Un au premier, un au troisième. Parce qu'il a deux différents screwballs. Il a un slow one et il a un hard one. Et j'ai dit, man, il va pas le faire le slow one, il va le faire le hard one off his fastball. Et il a me un cutter. Et il a jammed me. turned out to be a double play to run scored, but, you know, with two outs, we only got one run. Double jeu, les Expos se contentent d'un point. Ils ont Fernando dans les cordes. Puis comme disait tantôt, c'est le genre de lanceur que tu dois battre tôt dans un match parce que plus le match avance, meilleur il est, comme la plupart des bons lanceurs. Ils ont raté leur chance. Puis Dawson, on y a parlé après le match. Moi, je me souviens. Et, et, écoute, il ne pouvait pas frapper la batte plus fort que ça. Comme il dit, je peux pas frapper, je, je la guide pas. And he threw that little slider in there and, you know, totally opposite of the what you think he's going to do. And he made a perfect pitch on a great hitter. And, you know, the pitcher went out in that one, got the double play. We scored the only run of the game for us. What we were talking about, a starting pitcher. Get him early. People will say, well, what is that? That's first inning. How's that connected with the ninth inning? Well, it's totally connected because if it's five to nothing, Burr's throwing the way he was throwing. Five to nothing. And we win and we go. And we party and, and then go play in the World Series. Avec Valenzuela, au tout début, il faisait froid. Là, il était dans, dans le trouble. Mais lui, là, il s'est réchauffé à mesure que le match avançait. Puis il prenait confiance, puis il prenait confiance. Les expos n'ont plus rien fait contre lui. Là. Monday at third, the tying run, the goal head run, Guerrero at second. Valenzuela at the plate. the job done as he ties it up with a ground ball to second. Monday coming in. Lorsqu'on est arrivé vers la fin du match, Jeff Redden se réchauffe. Le qui c'est qui arrive dans l'entrée? Look who's warming up now in the Montreal bullpen. Steve Rogers, the ace of the Expo staff. Steve Rogers. Oh, Pelé. Là, j'ai dit, il se prépare quelque chose. Steve Rogers était supposé lancer le premier match de la série mondiale contre les Yankees. Moi, Reardon, je sais qu'il n'est pas vraiment en état de lancer. Parce qu'il était sur la, la table du soigneur euh, avant le match. C'était un bon releveur, mais il y a mal au dos. Et dans le 7e inning, je peux me souvenir, je 
believe it was Galen. It was Galen Cisco was the he said, okay, can you throw if he needs to? I said, absolutely, I can throw. Well, just be ready. A starting pitcher is a guy that takes a long time and he has a kind of a rhythm to get loose. Where a reliever has to get loose in seven or eight pitches. He is prepared, his arm is always stretched out, he can go. A starter does not play for five days, sometimes six before he gets it back into a ball game. So he has this regimen. It's like a it's like a giant sea tanker that goes out. If it's going out and it's 163 feet long, it's gonna take a long time to turn that sucker around and get it back to port. That's what a starting pitcher's like. A relief pitcher is like a little PT boat that can go out there. We can't go real long, but we can go quick. And I can get loose in a heartbeat. Get me into the ball game, coach. That thought process is now firmly implanted. I will be used. I think it then becomes when I'll be used, but I will be used. Burris is in the on-deck circle, but Steve Rogers is throwing in the Montreal bullpen again. Guerrero started back. Plenty of time to come in and make the play. One up. And now the decision. Pinch hit for Ray Burris. And Burris gets a hand as he goes to the dugout. Et Ray Burris nous a donné un match extraordinaire encore une fois. Et là, Steve Rogers était prêt. Puis là, Jim Fanning a appelé dans l'enclos d'exercice. Puis il a demandé s'il était prêt. Il dit oui. Il dit, t'es prêt à lancer? Il dit oui. Fait que Steve, euh, c'était pas son... C'est pas son rôle, C'est différent, un lanceur partant puis un lanceur de relève. En relève, il faut t'attaquer. Bang, bang, bang. Alors, Steve est arrivé dans, dans le match. I do not second guess Jim Fanning for that decision at all. Rogers was the best pitcher in the game. He was starting an inning. He didn't have to pitch out of the windup. And I thought, you go with your best in that situation. Jim, he va avec Steve Rogers. Le monde est debout. Moi, sur le coup, moi, être franc, là, plus ou moins d'accord, mais finalement, je me dis, Colin, c'est le plus gros match de l'histoire des Expos. Qui tu veux au monticule à l'heure ou à ce moment précis? Ton meilleur lanceur. C'est sûr, c'est pas un releveur. Je m'en fous. Quand j'y repense, j'y repensais souvent, j'en ai souvent parlé à Jim Fanning. Au début, j'ai second guessé cette affaire-là, là, mais moi, être franc avec toi, c'était la bonne décision. Well, I didn't think that... Uh, you know, he will, he will come in with uh, that minimal rest that he had from his previous start, uh, unless it was, you know, a situation where we had run out of options in the bullpen and the bullpen uh, was rested at that extra day. Uh, but, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, the decision was made that, you know, we were going to either uh, sink a, a swim with, with our ace. Fanning, he went with the, you know, Steve Rogers is our man, and he was doing it with his heart and not with his brain. And that's where we lost. A lot of people do things with their heart. Heart's a great thing, but you better have the head too. And so for the first time this year, Rogers comes in out of the bullpen. It's his game, ninth inning, tied at one. You know, I can, I can see myself breathing deeply, too. 0 for 3 today against Burris. Soft pop, and Rodney Scott has it. I didn't remember the first out being that easy. Lui aussi, il avait l'effet du froid, là. Mais quand t'arrives au monticule, c'est... Là, là, c'est... Il faut que tu produises. This is only the third time in his entire Major League career he's pitched in a relief. He falls behind, say, 3-0. and oh. Those were two sliders. They, they weren't good. I left this ball right there. Hit to left field, but 
is it deep enough? Reigns has room. I mean, I thought that was gone. Ça, c'est pas Steve Rogers. Rogers, c'est à Yawata des genoux presque tout le temps. Mais là, on aurait dit qu'il ne pouvait pas aller jusqu'au bout pour porter la balle jusqu'au genou. Fait que la balle, les balles sont restées là. Quand la, avec des frappeurs de circuit, quand les lancers sont hauts, euh, vous courez après être haut. When Rogers gave up the ball down the left field line, I knew he was in trouble. I knew he didn't have his stuff right when he left the bullpen. He was not ready. He was not ready to come in. And that's why I got ready in a hurry. I prepared myself for Rick Monday, and I did not get to face Rick Monday. Moi, en 1981, mon sideline, c'était l'annonceur des expos. Quand j'ai présenté euh, Rick Monday, il était voltigeur de droite. Voltigeur de droite, right fielder, Rick Monday. Et là, il s'amène au bâton. C'est un gros et grand gars, frappeur gaucher. Rick Monday's a lefty. You're a lefty. Mm -hmm. You know, it's physics. Explain that. It's physics. My my I, my arm is here. My ball runs in on him. My fastball runs in on him. He has a long, loopy swing. He's a good hitter, good low ball hitter. But I pound that sinker in on his hands, and he cannot. He, to hit that sinker, you have to bring your hands in this way. He could not have hit my sinker. He couldn't have. He could have hit it on the ground, but that's all he could do. He was never going to elevate it. The only pitch that I would have had trouble with him is if I hung a slider in a fastball count. Then I, that would speed up his bat, and he'd have a chance to hit a fly ball, and I wasn't going to give him that opportunity. I'm going to pound sinkers in on him all day long, and if I'm throwing the breaking ball, it's going to be this far off the plate when I'm ahead of him, and he's got to protect, and it forces him to swing the bat. That was my job at that moment of time and I didn't get to do my job. Two out. Suddenly becoming much darker. Out of play. Wow, I didn't remember that I threw the first pitch. I, I threw a good sinker and he fouled it off. Everyone within themselves, their own thoughts. Ooh. Bad curveball. Two bad curveballs. I always had that curveball, and it was because my uh, it's because my mechanics were so bad. I was rushing through the balance point, and the sinkers were flat. They weren't sharp. The curveballs were up. Three and one. I'm behind everybody. Rick Monday had some excellent swings these last two games. If you can have a count in your favor that you would like to have, other than 3-0, it'll be 3-1. I absolutely knew that he was the only left-hander, and he was the only guy on their squad that, that was swinging the bat well, and I, I, I tried to miss. I tried to miss down and away if I was going to do anything, and that ball was just like Saves, right up over the middle of the plate. And I happened to get a pitch up that was higher than you normally got from Steve Rogers. Gray Wayne, right field. And I hit the ball, and something happened that had never happened to me before. I lost the flight of the ball. À ma hauteur, là, où j'étais, là, c'était une des premières fois que je voyais une balle si haut. I did not know where it was. I knew it was hit really high. And as I'm going to first base, I started to watch Andre Dawson, who moved over into right center field and kept going. I'm thinking, well, it's hit so high, it's probably going to be caught. And then I saw him continue to run. I, uh, it was hit so high, and before I knew it, uh, I was right at the wall, and the ball was still in the park. Quand la balle est frappée, là, je suis pas loin d'être convaincu qu'elle a franchi la clôture, là, parce que c'est un stade où la balle voyage pas si bien que ça. My son Andy was at the ball game, and he said, Dad, look at the geese flying over the stadium. You know, they're going south for the winter. I go, bad omen. Bad omen. Plus un bruit de balle sur un, bo un, un bâton, là, toc! Tout le monde fige, là. Aussi calme que ça peut l'être, là, dans le moment, là. On regarde toute la balle aller. Bye-bye! Center 
Bryant hit well. Dawson back. And Monday will touch them all. Veteran Rick Monday. And I got caught in a dance between first and second jumping in the air that I almost fell down. Taken deep by Rick Monday. His day of the week. And with all the many big hits he has in his long career. This one's so very special. Là, Val de Rive, Val de Rome, pis ça, là, tu sais, y'a plus rien qui marche, là. Oh, c'est un, un espèce de vide, mon vieux, là. Je pense que j'ai entendu les pas de Rick Monday autour des buts. Un silence total. Puis là, je regarde dans les estrades, puis je vois des gens qui pleurent. Puis là, là, tu te dis, hey boy, ça vient de chercher, là. J'étais malheureux pour les gens. It was a funeral for 36 000 people. Mais pourtant, il reste encore un tour au bâton. Là. Moi, en tout cas, j'ai fait drôle. Euh... Je regardais ma valise, moi, et puis j'ai dit, « Hum, je pense qu'on n'ira pas à New York. Je... » On dirait que, je sais pas, le coup de circuit de Monday, là, ça... Waouh, c'est un coup de pognon. Two to one Dodgers, ninth inning. The bottom of the ninth did not start well for Montreal. Valenzuela retired the first two hitters. Ensuite, il a donné un but sur le bal à Gary Carter. Ensuite, il a donné un but sur le bal à Larry Parrish. Là, Tommy Lasorda, il dit, un instant, là, on change de lanceur. So, Lasorda goes to his bullpen after eight and two-thirds fabulous innings from Valenzuela. Welsh est arrivé, il a fait face à Jerry White. Il avait deux retraits. Là, c'était le silence complet dans le stade olympique. And the dream died. I went down into the clubhouse afterwards. It was quiet. I just remember um, it was just a sad feeling because Uh, even though it was my first year, first full season uh, with the Expos, I just felt like that was the year. That was really the year for us to do it. I don't think I really thought about, you know, what would next year bring or, or anything like that. I was just thinking, like, you know, we actually had a chance to go to the World Series. We were a game away from going to the World Series. And... Uh, It, uh, it just slipped out of our hands. It was devastating for everybody. I mean, you know, it, it, you just... It, it is just a game, but it's your livelihood, it's your life. And so, you know, it's tempered a little bit. It's certainly not like having your child in, in, in the hospital. And so, you know, I'm saying, yeah. So you can reflect on those kinds of things, but you don't really reflect on that in the locker room right after. You just, it's kind of a numbness. I played in the big leagues 20 plus years and it never happened. Um, that's the one thing that uh, sort of nags at you. I uh, took it very hard. I just said what, you know, Could I have done more? Or should I have done more? I, I just put a lot of the burden on, on myself. I just hate the Dodgers. Hate them more than the Yankees. And I know I got Rick Mundy out in college. I got him out in summer ball. I got him out my whole career. And I don't get to play against him. And it was like, here I am. I'm the right guy at the right moment to go in and pitch to him. He is not going to hit a home run off me. I'm going to run that sinker in on his hands. He's going to foul it off his foot. I'm going to throw him a slider away. He's going to wave at it. Game over. We win the game in extra innings. I could have thrown three or four innings. Three good innings I had in me, and I didn't get to use them. I had bullets in my gun and didn't get to use them. That's the worst feeling in the world. The feeling that you're in the on-deck circle and you can hit and you don't get to hit. 
or to be in the bullpen and not get in the game. That's one of the reasons I still play baseball. I have a lot of unfinished anger that I did not get to play, you know. I could not believe we did not win the last game. I still to this day cannot believe that Rick Mundy hit a home run. What's really kind of funny is that the next year we came into town, we had an early game in, in New York. And Steve Yeager, who was our catcher, um, we went to dinner. And a gentleman came over and said, I have to ask you to leave. And we said, well, the kitchen's open till 10 o'clock. It's only 7 o'clock. He goes, well, I'm not worrying about that. He said, but I don't want any fights in here. I said, we're not going to fight. We're going to have dinner. He goes, well, you have to convince the table of six back here that we're not going to have a fight. And we were asked to leave. personal connection the average Montrealer who was you know watching games and involved in, in in the baseball world at, at that time with me is that pitch where they were on the day that the home run was hit and so that's the first thing that comes out of their mouth but it's okay it's okay and I hope it's not the only thing they remember I truly I truly have come to to uh, respect that as just a way to say, that's my connection with you.